Okay, can we have your attention, please? It's nice to see you all come out here today when the weather's this miserable. But uh, our pre uh, Caleb Schmidt is going to be giving the presentation on this solar system. This is the solar system that we're going to install in our new building that we put up last year. And uh, the uh, presentation will take questions and answers as he goes along. So if you have anything that you uh, would like to ask him, he's uh, the person to ask. So thanks a lot for coming, and Caleb is yours. Perfect. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, so yes, as Cliff mentioned, my name's uh, Caleb Schmidt, and uh, and we uh, we designed and supplied the, the system that will be going up for uh, for the museum here. And then the presentation itself is going to be, we're just going to kind of run through uh, just a basic overview of, uh, of solar technology and kind of how it applies to industry. Um, just kind of a basic overview because there's, there's uh, you know, off-grid or battery based just like what's going to be here where there's no utility connection, then there's utility connection. So we're just going to kind of walk through it and give you guys an overview of, of what's what and then, uh, and then hopefully we'll make decent time and then we can even go out and talk a little bit about the specific system where it's going to be sited here and just, you know, if we're able to do that and talk about the specific system here but we'll just do a, a basic presentation uh, on on solar and um, and then yeah and as Cliff said we can just kind of take questions as we go through otherwise we find that I mean sometimes by the end you've kind of forgotten or, or what have you so we can just go through with questions if you have a question you can just uh, put up your hand or you know, just start talking and we'll, we'll we'll go from there a nice informal setting so um, a little bit about who we are can everyone see fine you can see the TV yeah all right so we are uh, based out of Red Deer, Alberta. Uh, that's where our facility's at, and that uh, we uh, we uh, stock the equipment. We do a lot of system assembly there, our design work, and then uh, we're able to ship stuff. Uh, uh, do a lot of stuff in Western Canada, but have had the privilege of <laughs> the shipping uh, product uh, uh, into uh, all parts of Canada, all the provinces we've done and territories over the last uh, nine years. So. Um, uh, we we do a lot of uh, travel, uh, good equipment out, uh, product out. So uh, there's a picture last summer going into Vancouver. So I uh, spent a lot of time on the road. And a little bit about us. So we were founded in uh, 2005, and we are a, a technical oriented company. So we do a lot of design and engineering work, and of course system supply. But uh, we our our strength is really you know the whole supply chain right from design and, and, and uh, design is actually the most important aspect uh, of this whole whole deal. If it's not designed right, no matter how well it's uh, uh, put together, like installed or what have you, if it's not designed right, it's, it's not going to work. So, uh, you know, design is really uh, very important. So uh, we pride ourselves on that uh, technical ability. And uh, we kind of have two uh, operating channels. So we do uh, off-grid system design. So off-grid would be classified as uh, you have uh, your batteries for storage, and then uh, um, you would basically have no outside utility connection. Like uh, you, you're, you are your own power supplier. So that's what we would classify as off-grid. So there can be a backup generator and you know another source of power in there, but off-grid would be you no know, no utility coming into the, the site at all. And then we have grid ties, so we can do. Uh, uh, we do systems that uh, basically interact with the utility. So if you have uh, a utility connection already and uh, want a way to produce your own power and, and lower your energy costs, then we can generate a system or uh, design and install a system that basically generates energy uh, during the day when the sun's shining and, and feeds power into the the uh, building and the home. And if you're not using it, it'll actually export it back to the grid. And, and in BC, you can net meter, so it records the flow going back to the utility, and and then your utility uh, will credit you at the same rate that you buy power at uh, in a scenario like that. So uh, in a grid tie system, you basically, you know, at night you run off your utility, that's your battery bank. Um, so both systems have their place and, and uh, you know, both systems depending on the site and if you need to bring power in, like the economics, uh, you know, we have to look at each 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 site and, and uh, you know, which route is more economical, right? But typically if you have, like if the building already has a utility connection, then, you know, a utility grid tie system is, is uh, is the way to go. Uh, you know, if you do have a, a new building that's going up and you have to factor in bringing power in, then, then of course off-grid can be certainly feasible too, right? So, uh, so we're going to go through a, a little bit of off-grid, kind of see see what the different applications that we do with off-grid. So this is a typical off-grid uh, uh, grid home that we would do. Um, 
and uh, so it's just a uh, family that built uh, a typical home and and uh, this particular system <coughs> has a, a six kilowatt PV array, so that's pretty standard uh, for uh, you know a family of, of um, you know three or four, um, and a six kilowatt PV system uh, would allow a generation of about uh, 15 ki or a consumption of about 15 kilowatt hours per day. Uh, you know because we certainly have to match the systems up properly. If you're not generating as much as you're using, uh, you know then either the generator runs a lot or you run out of power. So that, that's where it comes to the, the design aspect and making sure it's done right. So. Uh, that's a pretty typical setup with the with a home, and this is the type of inverter system that we would uh, use. So um, this takes the energy from the battery bank that's stored uh, at night and, and provides power uh, to the home, and also during the day it, it allows uh, it regulates the energy coming from the PV array. Uh, so during the day the, the solar system can power the home directly. And, uh, and convert the, the DC power from the solar array into AC for your home. And, uh, and so during the day, you know, if you're, if you, uh, a lot of times you don't even have to use your batteries uh, per se, just because you can supply all your load requirements by the, the, uh, the sun. So, um, you know, when you live off grid, you learn uh, some techniques, like if the sun's really shining, you can do some heavier loads. Uh, if you have some tools to run or what have you, because then you don't have to work your batteries, you can just take that energy right from the sun and, and help your batteries last longer. So um, that's the type of inverter system that, that allows us to take uh, the energy from the, the sun and the batteries and, and uh, use it for your home. And So this is an expo exposed view of the batteries. Uh, so there's eight here and a, a typical home would have uh, 16, so two groups of eight. And uh, you know by the time we're done, they'll be enclosed and, and safe, but this gives you an exposed view. And, and again, a uh, typical home or building would have 16 of these batteries. And uh, you know that would give the average home about uh, three days of, of backup before, you know, if there's no sun before, either you have to, oh, go ahead. Technology, is it lead acid gel cell? This is an AGM, so absorbed glass mat. So this would be a, a sealed battery that, you know, there's no uh, maintenance required for them. You don't have to add any distilled water or, or check the electrolytes. Yes. May I ask how long would those batteries last for? It all depends on, on the cycle life uh, or the, the amount of cycles that they go through because all the batteries' life is rated in cycles if you look at their data sheet. So these batteries. Uh, at a 50% discharge, they're rated for about 1,200 cycles or so. Uh, so for the average home, uh, that would work. The average home would cycle a battery about every three days, like fully cycle it. Um, so you would, uh, you know, that could be anywhere from, typically eight years is pretty standard, right? So it all depends on how, how hard you work them, right? So, you know, some people, uh, you know, we can upsize the battery bank a, a little higher on the capacity side, so they cycle less and, and last longer, but it's a balance too, because if you have too much battery and you can't fully charge them, then that, that deteriorates their lifespan too, right? So there is a design aspect there to make sure that everything's balanced properly, but... So yeah, for the average home it's eight years. We've had people get, um, uh, like out of this type of battery, an L16, uh, just last summer, someone on the, on the coast or on the island here, they, uh, they got 14 years out of a, a, uh, an L16 battery like this, just because they were, it was a retired family and they were able to just really take time with their batteries and, and, and uh, not work them too hard. And it was just a perfect setup, right? So, uh, so yeah, life depends, right? But we try to, uh, when we size a system, when, we, when we're looking at your consumption and look at sizing the PV array and battery bank, we try to have it so you would fully cycle them about every two and a half to three days. So you get around that, you know, eight year lifespan out of them. But it really depends how you work them in the end, so. Yes. There, I think there was another question back there. And then I'll have. Are they a six volt or twelve volt? They're they're six volts. So we typically use six volts uh, in the system. There are two volts that are available, like two volt batteries. Uh, the two two volts would give you your best uh, life, um, but then we're looking at a cost balance and life balance because two volts you would need, like for a 48 volt system, you'd need 24 of them, right? So then you have a lot more batteries. Uh, then you have to figure in the cost of all those batteries too. Plus the two volts tend to be heavier, and a lot of times when we go to site, unless it's a perfect site where you can, you know have a machine bring the batteries in we gotta we gotta you know 
factor in being able to, to move these things around, right? So, you know, that's another factor why we, we use six volts too, right? Just because, you know, one or two people can move them more on a dolly, right? Where you can get them into place. Because if someone builds a home and, and you have to go down to the utility room downstairs, you don't want to be, you know, all of a sudden like, well, how am I going to get the batteries down here, right? We need some kind of lift, right? So, so how big are those ones there, like, the, from the picture as far as... Yeah, they would be about 16 inches high, uh, 8 inches wide, and about 12 inches deep. Okay. And they're about 115 pounds each, so they're heavy heavy enough as it is. I, I'm, I'm totally not a technological person, but I was just, what, what yeah. do you mean when when a battery cycle? Like what's so that, that, that would be considered when you take enough energy out of it to go from full to dead, right? Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so that would be, you know, most people use about 40% of the battery bank kind of every day, 35 to 40%. Okay. And then so over about three days, you would, that would be like a full cycle, right? So, okay. Yeah. What about a, uh, excuse me, what about a, a situation where you've got a occasional use, like a seasonal use property? Property, the, the cabin or a houseway uh, that you may not be there for a couple of months. Or yeah, with the with the proper equipment, like any of the uh, equipment that you saw here with that inverter system and stuff, that's what we we consider our, our full time or our you know that's our advanced equipment. So it has all the technology to regulate all that. So you know if the batteries become completely full and there's nowhere for the energy to go, uh, the solar array will just disconnect. Like the controllers will disconnect the array from the batteries, and and so that they'll just it's constantly monitored. So the charge controller stuff will monitor the battery voltage uh, so then uh, you know they might be disconnected for a day or two if there's no power being used right and then as they slowly self-discharge then it might the array will reconnect again to keep them full right so it's all self-regulated with the, the proper equipment and you know that's one thing if you you know you do your research you'll find there's a huge span of equipment out there from you know the low end to the really high end so and they all do different stuff right so b based on your particular application you know we want to make sure that you have the right equipment right because we do have very simple systems and then we have a van systems too just depending on what you're doing right so yes with the solar batteries if you only use them like during the summer it's on a travel trailer yeah should you charge them up during the winter and kind of use them does that extend the life or does that deter it yeah you definitely want to keep them charged uh, if you let them discharge or sit in a in a like a stoic state then, then they can start to uh, um, crystallize or like they can uh, sulfate and uh, and that's okay. not good for the batteries either so if you can like if your RV is, is parked outside and you're able to like if you have a solar module on top or, or able to keep it plugged in or I mean, in that case some people take the batteries out and put them on a charger uh, every once in a while in a shop it just depends on your, your situation right but if you have a solar module on the RV roof and the RV is outside uh, most people just you know they can keep the module cleared we'll keep it hooked up and it'll stay charged through the winter and yeah Yes. Median cost of, of a, a better quality battery is what, 300 Yeah, these particular batteries here, uh, full retail price on those would be about 480 or so. Okay, so 500 and a bank of 16 that's a capital cost that you'd need to look at rolling every seven, eight years. Yeah, yeah. so when we do, like when we do um, uh, an analysis for a client, we'll do a performance and cost analysis and we factor all that in, right? So, and we typically, will, well, we do it to make it simpler, we'll do like an average system life, right? Because the solar modules themselves uh, will last much longer than the batteries, right? And then we can combine them together. But yeah, when you, when certainly when you're looking at these systems, you have to factor in the, the, the replacement costs. And, and when we do our calculations for you to show you, we, we figure those in, right? So. But yeah, you do have to factor in replacement costs, right? So, and in yeah. terms of replacement, yeah. is it something that you would need to do, or could we do it ourselves? Yeah, you could certainly do it yourself. I mean, it would require removing the old batteries and, and disassembling them and then hooking the new ones up. So if you're familiar with that basic, uh, uh, you know, electrical work, then that's fine. Yeah. So it's not... So um, the system would reset? Uh, the system it has the systems are all for that we use like this would have a non-volatile memory right so okay. even if you shut them down for several days all the the data is stored in there right so yeah yeah and then so you don't have to go back through and reprogram everything okay. yeah so at this point the insurance industries and the building codes and everything else don't have a problem with people replacing batteries on their own it's not like you have to get an electrician to come in no no you don't no no like when we when we first do a system certainly you want to make sure like if we're installing the system uh, ourselves we'll go to the municipality and, and see if they need development permits or building permits and of course electrical permits and if those are all in place to begin with and it's all done to code then and certainly you can change stuff out as needed you know down the road and there's no issue right so do yeah. you 
like an ordinary car battery? Do you have to have them in a special room that's ventilated? These these particular ones, no, you wouldn't. So um, uh, these, I mean, all batteries technically will will uh, sulfate somewhat over time, and and these batteries will too, but they're. Um, then not near to the level of a lead acid like with the electrolyte that sloshes around in the inside so with these ones we do um, you know the manufacturers we do set the voltage uh, parameters uh, high enough that they get a decent charge so you know you do uh, do uh, not really mix up the electrolyte in these because it's like a gelatin but you still stimulate it really well so it, it fully charges um, so yeah with our programming we make sure everything's set right too for these particular batteries so you get the maximum amount of life out of them so, so there's no out gas Problem. No, so you would still like for code, um, and I mean code can vary uh, depending because there's the Canadian Electric Code, and the Canadian Electric Code, like our current 2012 code, does speak to battery enclosure and stuff like that. But uh, whenever we go, like for installing a system, we go to the municipality. Uh, we'll usually talk to the uh, the inspecting officer because uh, they have the final say on, on what's going on, and uh, and just make sure we'll tell them what well this is what we do as standard, and uh, see if they have a problem with that. So with these batteries here, we would just simply you know enclose them just so you know you can't. There's a lot of energy stored in them, so you don't want to set anything on the battery terminals or or have anyone set anything on there or mess around with them, right? So we would simply close them. These ones don't need to be vented or anything like that, right? So as long as they're 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 safe tucked out of the way, then that would be code compliant, yeah. What about heated areas? Do they have to be inside or? Uh, they don't have to. And these these particular batteries are very resilient in the cold weather. Like we use the AGM technology a lot in the oil and gas. Like they're just in a box in minus 20 out in Alberta, right? And, and uh, the only issue that you deal with is when they do get cold, their capacity drops, right? So uh, if you're if you're building uh, new, uh, you definitely want to factor in, you know, having your util utility room large enough for your invert and your battery and stuff inside because if you can keep them around 15 to 20 degrees you're going to get your best performance and, and life out of them right so because if you put them in a cold area like some people especially with cabins they might put them on the outside and and uh, you know insulate them a bit and, and you can do that and that's fine but as their capacity drops and it gets cooler then you cycle them more so then they, they uh, their life is shortened too right so you know it's all a balance if you spend a little bit more time and, and money to get them inside where they can stay at room temperature in the long run you'll get better life and performance out of them yeah <clears throat> Any other questions on the batteries? Oh, all right, that was a good one. <laughs> so this is a this is another six kilowatt array, and this is pretty typical. This is more of a temporary setup. Uh, we get a lot of people that will do a uh, uh, a system. This is for another uh, family that uh, um, a couple years ago they built on a quarter section of land, <coughs> and uh, you know their uh, shops going up now, and they have a mobile home on the property. And uh, they were living in that until uh, uh, they get their house developed and then uh, and built. And uh, and then this array will be moved up on the hill on a metal stand when and when everything's done, right? But it's um, so this is just an example of, of, of uh, a common setup. So ground mount array. There's 24 modules uh, in this one. So this would be a six kilowatt array, and and uh, it's just sip, uh, simply mounted on on a base there, and and the. Uh, the uh, the aluminum mounts that are holding the modules are just secured down to the base, and, and uh, away you go. So uh, yeah, and again, uh, I mean, it's systems. Your consumption is what what dictates your, uh, your system size. So whenever we look at you know, if you're looking at wanting to do a system, you know, we'd go through and build an energy budget, see how much energy you're going to use, especially if you're going to be off grid, right? And then and then size the system accordingly to that, right? And, what does the panel like that weigh? Pardon? What does the panel like that weigh? Uh, one panel is uh, about 45 pounds. Uh, so that entire setup there uh, with the mounting equipment and stuff would probably be about 1,800 pounds. Um, uh, we usually like... Um, this system is a little heavier than the standard one that we'd mount on a roof, but if we're going to mount a system on a roof, it's typically about three pounds per square foot that it adds for load on the roof. So it's not that bad because it's spread out over a, a decent amount of area. What's the dimension of that? That that would be about 54 feet long, okay. and you're about 10 feet deep, and uh, probably about uh, 10 feet higher. So okay. yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. The, when the sun strikes that, the electrons get dislodged and they move yep. through the system. I presume that if the system isn't completing a loop, yep. 
then the electrons don't get dislodged and just stay where they That's normally right. reside. Yep, yep, yeah, because the energy has to have, to have somewhere to go, right? So right. if we, uh, like in this particular system, there's a combiner box here, so all the, uh, the, the wiring for the array comes into here, and then there's breakers in there, so we can just simply turn off the breakers, right. and the modules can just sit there and, and they they just do nothing, right? So yeah, they, just, okay. they just get warm. Are, are you, uh, is it better to have a system that adjusts for sun level? Uh, th this one will tilt, so like, they can lift it up in the winter and put it down. Um, we don't, there are tracking arrays out there, um, and they will increase your, your uh, generation, but the, the cost to do that is, is much higher than what it is just to add more modules, right? So some people will do, uh, and tracking really doesn't save space either, right? Because when the, when the modules move, uh, you have to account for the shading too, right? So you have to space them quite far apart because as the sun, let's say, goes down to the west and the modules move, the one that's in the front is casting a shadow to the one that's in the back, right? So we have to start spacing them out quite a ways, right? Like if we do a standard pole mount like this particular one, we'll just skip back here real quick. Like this pole mount here, those are only about six inches apart, right? Because we don't have to worry about any shading. Uh, if we, if if those if those units turned and tracked, uh, those would have to be about 15 feet apart. So you know, all of a sudden you're taking up a lot more real estate, right? So it'd be a lot easier just to add, you know, another another pole mount just stationary than to add a tracking unit. And a tracking unit to work for our climate, uh, you see here would be so bad if you guys don't get too cold, but. Uh, for a good track for Canadian climate, it's about uh, to hold six modules like that would be about eight thousand dollars. So you know they're expensive too. What's yeah. your cost per panel? Uh, the cost per panel for those Kia Serras, uh, the retail price is just under four hundred dollars a module. Four hundred dollars what? A module per per panel, yeah. Yeah. Do you have to keep them clean during the winter too then uh, uh, with the snow? Yes, yeah, Dur during the winter we find if, it, if it's below minus 15 then, then you will need to clean them. Like they won't, uh, the sun heating them won't generate enough heat to, to melt and it off. What do you clean them with? Uh, because once you scratch them... Yeah, the best thing is actually just like a snow rake, like you can get at Canadian Tire, a lot of home uh, home uh, supply stores. It's just, it's the same thing that you use to clean your uh, roof off, it just has like the plastic uh, sh uh, shovel, so same thing that you shovel. Run the oh, no. scratching? Oh no, they're tempered glass, they're, oh, they're, okay. they would be more resilient than like the windshield in your car, like I can stand on them. Oh, okay. um, and when we do, like if we do a big array on a, a commercial building where, you know, you get, uh, you know, hundreds of square feet I mean we actually have to walk on them to be able to work on them right so yeah they're very resilient I mean they are breakable but I mean they, they will last when we put them on a building they will outlast anything on a building your roofing system you know siding uh, I guess it depends what kind of siding you have but they're very resilient right most people think they're very fragile which they're not but they're they're, uh, they're not unbreakable but they're very tough so the best angle is, is 90 degrees to the Sun yeah, well, you want to keep them perpendicular to the sun, right? But uh, that would be their best output. But then again, we run into cost, right? So uh, for most roofs, like if it's just a, if we do an off-grid system where you can, you can adjust it, then usually the winter they sit at about 60 degrees, and then in the summer they'll sit down at about 30, right? Um, I mean, to try to build a mount and get like infinite mounting positions and stuff is doable. But then again, it's always a cost benefit, uh, you know. And we want to make it simple too, right? So and you don't lose that much. I mean, it's and a lot of systems, like especially for a grid tie system, like a lot of people will, like if we do a grid tie system, uh, we'll just mount it flush on the roof. Even in the winter, you might get a couple months of snow cover in the winter. Uh, but that's when you make the least amount of energy too, right? So we look at your en energy production on a uh, on a yearly basis. So e each system is so sp site specific, right? So when we look at your details, then we can, you know, we look at your site and see what you're dealing with, then we can recommend the best, right? But it's, uh, it's definitely not one size fits all when, when it comes to, to implementing a system. System, but um, yeah, it's it, off grid. Certainly, you want to be able to tilt them up because you you know you want to get as much energy as you can, right, every month of the year. But and in, in winter, do you get any wind damage, or is the the structure strong enough to withstand? Yeah, like the, all our mounting equipment uh, certainly is designed. Uh, our mounting equipment is engineered for 90 mile an hour wind speeds. Uh, the modules are rated uh, for 110 mile an hour wind speeds. But certainly, you have to make sure the whole envelope is uh, is, is suitable, right? So, for mounting to a roof and whatnot, you know, we have to look at the truss system and, and everything and make sure that it's suitable, right? And to handle the snow loads, the wind loads, all that kind of stuff, right? So, yeah, that's very important because. 
especially if, it, if it's uh, ground mount and you tilt it up, it's basically like a big sail, right? There's a lot of area there that's catching the wind, right? So, you know, and, and that comes to, you know, proper equipment, even proper modules, right? And the Kia Sera modules that we recommend, they're on the higher end of the price level because we can get, I mean, we do carry a couple different brands of modules, but we can get, I mean, we get solicitations for mo modules from, you know, China for 50 cents a lot, right? And, and, and so, but the issue, we've seen a lot of low quality modules, how they're constructed. We, we've actually seen modules blow out from the back uh, just because the frames aren't very strong. There's not very much frame there, like holding the encapsulated glass in. So we've seen modules where, you know, the gusts of wind have blown the, the cells right out from the frame, right? So, you know, those are all the considerations when you're you're putting a system up, right? Is, is you want good equipment because it's going to be there for a long time. And if half your rate is destroyed, if you save, you know, 20% up front, that's soon gone replacing stuff, right? And, and whatnot, right? So it's, yeah, there's a lot of details to to look at. Uh, this is another, uh, so this is just another typical inverter system. Uh, this is, uh, the client installed this system here and, and it's in a shed and there's actually a generator in there. The batteries are covered up here and we'll see on the next slide. And again, this is a temporary until their house gets built and everything's gonna move into a nice uh, utility room. These are the batteries that are with that same system. Uh, there's 16 here. And these are the wet, wet lead acid types. So these are the kind that need maintenance. And, uh, and you need to top up with water, you need to equalize them. And uh, they're about 40% uh, less than like an AGM. Uh, they're about 350 bucks a piece, right? But then you have to equalize them, you have to, to, uh, to add water to them. And they're also not as efficient either. Like the AGMs uh, are much more efficient in, in, in accepting the energy. Uh, these will, we find on balance, um, these will accept about 80% of the energy that's put into them. The rest is, is burnt off as heat or, or whatever, right? So, is yes. the lifetime overall a bit longer then? Yeah, the, with the lead acids, if you're really diligent with the uh, the maintenance and, and with not cycling too hard, you can make them last longer than the AGMs. But we find on balance for 99% of the applications, the AGMs will always outlast just because these batteries aren't, if they're not in the perfect condition, the perfectly maintained, then they don't, they, they don't last as long, right? So it's, um, yeah, and, and this particular client here, he put in the lead acids, and, and the AGM pricing has come down a lot too. Like when he purchased this system, uh, the AGMs are about 640 bucks a pop, right? And uh, they've dropped by, you know, almost 200 bucks. And, uh, and so he went with the lead acids, but when he upgrades, uh, he plans to upgrade uh, when he moves everything into the house in a couple of years, right? So um, then he'll go with the AGMs at that point because he's he's about my age and he's he does the maintenance and stuff, but he'd rather be doing other stuff too, right? So, so an but, aspect uh, that I've know I've, I've seen covered a bit more is uh, <coughs> for firefighters when they come to your house. Uh, yeah. If you have roof-mounted units, they're worried about what's going to happen if they have to fight a fire there. If you have banks of batteries in your house somewhere. They worry about that. Yeah. Do, do you have any, in your area, is there any, any push to have regulations or standards or? Yeah, there, there are. Some municipalities are, are, are fussy about that. It's, um, and more, more of it's, uh, we don't have too many issues with the batteries. Um, as of yet, like it's, there will be some environmental issues that'll pop up, like, you know, if the house is on fire and these are in here, you know, like how, how do we handle that? We haven't seen too much of that yet, but we have seen for like rooftop applications, like uh, in grid tie applications uh, with high voltage DC running through the roof, um, uh, having to, like if the fire if the fire crew had to, you know, punch a hole in your roof to, to access and put water in, they don't want to be going through high voltage DC lines that aren't disconnected when they pull the meter or whatever, right? So um, there are some issues surrounding that. And we get around that through different, we use different equipment. So it's actually, like if we do a grid tie system, it's actually all AC from the roof down. Uh, so then when they pull the meter out, then the entire wiring system's dead. There's no live wires anywhere. So it depends on how a system's designed. But yeah, municipalities are starting to have questions and issues, right? So, but yeah, batteries are, we haven't run into too much yet, but they will come, right? So, uh, you know, we do have, uh, I mean, we just kind of approach it as it comes, right? And, and we do get questions already, but you go through and, and uh, you know, some municipalities, like when we do uh, get building permits, they want, you know, a, more of a tray built or whatever for the battery. If there's, you know, if, if the case does melt and the electrolyte leaks out, then there's a catch Captured. basin for that. So, yeah, we run into that kind of stuff. So you just kind of deal with it as it comes, so. 
so this is a typical generator that's used off-grid for a system that's used year-round. Uh, so this is just a diesel gen set that's in a shed with, with that inverter system and those batteries. And then when we designed the system, we designed it with uh, the building. The little building has uh, an exhaust fan and an automatic louver to let fresh air in for, for combustion. And then the exhaust is just routed out. So it's in about a, uh, a 10 by 12 building. It's all uh, self-contained and all automated. It's uh, The generator starts based on load levels uh, in the house or on the battery voltage level. And it's all automated and, and uh, away you go. So it's pretty simple. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, off-grid industrial, so this is another segment of the market which the end user like you guys wouldn't see too much, but if you keep your eye open with different telecommunication sites, if you look on the mountain hills you'll probably see repeaters and stuff up there. If you look close enough you'll see a lot of solar up there. Um, so this is a typical system that we would do for a telecommunication company or oil and gas company, mining company, and again they use they use the same product, it's, it's set up a little different and configured a little bit different. Um, but it, uh, it does the uh, basic thing. Uh, another popular item of ours is these little lighting systems. Um, uh, we do a lot of lighting systems for, uh, you know, just gated areas or, you know, this little sign. It's a little LED spotlight. Uh, this particular company, you can see their building back there. If they didn't have any power out to the road and to, to trench out power was going to be a lot more than just install a little solar system out at the front of the driveway. And then they have an LED light on each side that just uh, lights up the signs at night and it comes on automatically and, and shuts off automatically and, and away you go. So that's just another another application of solar that a lot of people don't think about. And again, it's self-contained. We pre-build the system in our facility, so all that was pre-built. and The batteries are sitting in an insulated box here, and they just sit outside, and then away they go, year after year. And that's what it looks like at night. So it's all lit up and, and bright. Yeah, we have a city sign set up. Pretty yeah, much the same thing. yeah I, I saw that coming in. So just another uh, uh, off off grid industrial system. So we did we did several of them for Agri Food Canada for their monitoring systems out uh, across Alberta, and uh, they put these out in crops and measure oxygen levels and CO2 levels and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, now we're into grid tie uh, residential commercial. So uh, in the last couple of years, with the cost of solar dropping so much, we've we've started doing a lot more of this, where where people will actually add uh, solar to their their home that already has a utility connection. Uh, so this particular system, I think it worked out to 10 kilowatts. I think there are exactly 40 modules on the roof there. Um, but yeah, you can see uh, you can see the modules mounted on the roof. It's flush mount right on a uh, uh, asphalt shingle roof. And this particular system, uh, well, as we go through here, you'll see how we've designed it. So there's the racking system there, and each module in this particular system has its own little inverter that connects to the module. So right from the module, the module's DC, it plugs into the inverter and it's converted to 240 volt AC right there. And then we, uh, you know, we string it all together properly and then it comes down to your electrical uh, system in the, in the building and basically just interacts with the utility, feeds the home power uh, during the day and then, and then you run off the utility at night, it's all seamless. And uh, most provinces uh, uh, now, I think every province but Manitoba offers net metering where you can just simply install a system and, and the energy just flows both ways and they record that and they credit you any power that goes back out at the same rate that you pay for it. Uh, so it's a pretty simplistic system. It's, it's easy to put up and it's, there's no, uh, no maintenance to this at all. It's, it's very easy for the homeowner. It's, um, there's no batteries involved, right? So it's very, very simple and, and easy to, to use. So uh, you can see here how the, the rail system mounts on the roof. We have a flashing system. With all our systems, we make sure there's proper, you know, flashing and anchoring systems. So, uh, you know, a lot of times the roof gets overlooked. People will use, uh, you know, cheap uh, L feet or not proper anchoring systems or flashing, and uh, uh, we get a lot of complaints. Uh, people coming back to us, saying, you know, my roof's leaking. What do I need, uh, you know, to fix it? Well, you know, it's basically you have to tear everything off and you know put proper equipment on, right? It's it's tough. So if you do it right from the beginning, you know, this system can uh, can last a very long time and, uh, you know, the roof underneath it can last a long time. So, and we usually recommend, like with a grid tie system, if you're going on the roof, uh, if the roof's more than uh, five years old, uh, if it's, uh, depending on the roof surface or type, you know, then it might be look at replacing the roof before you put the system on, because if you have to, you know, pull the system off in five or six years, then that's not, 
you know, that's going to cost some money, right? So go ahead at the back there. Um, are you seeing in residential uh, situations more roof mounts than stanchion mounts, or vice versa? Uh, yeah, in, in in an urban area, yeah, certainly. Um, we we're starting to do a lot of roof mounts like this, and in uh, in the urban areas, uh, acreages and stuff like that, right? I hear that if they're not bonded to the roof, if they're actually elevated by about five or six inches. Yeah, right? they're both they're both cooling. It, you get a cooling effect. Too. Yeah, we try to keep them at least six inches off the roof. Uh, there are there are roof designs and stuff where to, you know they try to get them nice and sleek so they're right down to the roof. Uh, but then you do lose a lot of production because your modules heat up quite a bit. Um, so that's something to consider too. We like to keep them off the roof a little bit so you can get some proper airflow around them. So okay on a steel roof. They're okay on a steel roof, yeah. And we just use a different type. Instead of using a flashing and stuff, we just actually have like a, a lag bolt with the rubber sealing wash and stuff that goes on there so we can still seal it properly, but you're okay on a metal roof, yep. And we can do tile roofs. We can do wood shakes. It's, there's, yeah, there's pretty much an option for everything. So. Sorry. Clearly there's a saving on the on-grid one because you saved the battery and the capital cost and the capital cost extended. What's yep. the appreciable increase <coughs> in the panel settings uh, for an on-grid or, or on net metering system. They're proportionally more, I would assume, uh, uh, than the other one. You mean the solar modules? Yes. Uh, no, we, we can use the same solar modules and everything. Is that okay, what you but mean? then you've got inverters on each one of them, okay. which has got to be okay. a capital. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it works out to be close to the same because, yeah, you do have inverters uh, on each one, um, but they're much smaller, so they're, they, they cost, like if we look at usually a central inverter, like we're doing a residential application, like just the cost for a central inverter versus the micro inverters is less. Um, not by too much, maybe five or six percent, sometimes 10 percent uh, of your capital cost, but one of the things that we spoke to earlier uh, is uh, when you have a central inverter, you have high voltage DC wire running through your roof down to the central inverter and then it's converted to AC and goes to your distribution right. panel. A lot of municipalities um, now won't allow us to just have that high voltage DC running through there without some kind of disconnect system. So if the, if the inverter shuts down, then on the roof the, 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 the DC voltage is shut down as well, right? Um, so then we have to install a relay system and those relay systems are about two grand to install okay. a disconnect. So there's a whole bunch of design factors that come into place and, and usually with the micro inverters it's a lot easier for us to get approval from uh, inspectors and stuff because they understand okay it's AC from the roof coming down that's simple enough we all understand that right whereas if you uh, you know we've had we've had some clients um, when we're doing the quoting process like uh, we our standard systems are all micro inverts but we, we get some people that yes I'd like the central inverter can you quote that and when we you know when we hand them okay this is going to be the price uh, you know if a building inspector or an electrical inspector wants an engineering analysis done on the inverter system to make sure that it's going to be compliant everything shuts down that can be two thousand bucks to have an engineer look over that right so you know there's all those things that we have to balance right so yeah the capital cost for the system uh, is a little bit more with the micro inverse but once we look at the installed price all done uh, they typically will always come out a little less right when we factor so they're going to net out at about the same anyway so yeah yeah, yeah yeah so and then it makes it a lot easier and to the one thing that's nice about the micro inverters uh, you know they are with a central inverter uh, you know, if your inverter goes down, then your whole range down, right? Yeah. So whereas yeah. this is all individual, and these are one of the only inverters now that have a 25-year warranty on them too, right? So, you know, they're designed to, to last as long as the modules that are on the roof, right? So, um, but yeah, you can see how each micro inverter is mounted on there. You know, we come through the roof, roof penetration, another proper flashing, everything's sealed off, right? So, you know, with this roofing system, there's not going to be any issues uh, down the road. Uh, and uh, so it's done right and, and looks good. Excuse on me. Some, on yep. some of the uh, modules, oh. do they have a micro inverter built into them? There are. There is one manufacturer, Endelay, now that's making AC modules. Yeah, where the 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 uh, inverter is built right into the module. Yeah. And how does that go? Uh, we actually haven't. Uh, haven't used them yet. We actually have a training day. Manufacturers putting on a training day May seventh, so we'll be able to see actually see them in action, and see how that works. But yeah, basically it's the same. I mean, it's the same idea. It's just all integrated in, right? Yes. Like, and then they just, um, just we haven't a chance to see together. it, but yeah, they would just plug together and should be very way. simple to do, very cheap. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's where it's going is to get it all integrated and, and less parts. And Could easy. not a handy fellow put that sort of thing up? 
Oh yeah, like if you're if if you're certainly able to put it up, and uh, you know all the systems have to be inspected uh, before they're commissioned, right? So as long as you're confident, you can do it to code. Yeah. yeah, I mean we get we get probably over right now over half of the systems that we sell are are installed by the uh, like not installed by us either by a contractor or by the end user themselves, right? Yeah. So yeah, you can certainly put Excuse them up. Me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me which quality of panels you used on that project and what the total cost was? Uh, this particular one that we're talking about right now? Yeah. Uh, this particular one, we used Konergy modules. Um, the, the, the total system cost uh, would have came out to about $3.80 per watt. Uh, that would be about, the, the electricity we're able to produce from this was at about $0.10 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, the actual modules, like just the PV modules, uh, they would be, those Konergies are, are a lower cost module, they're about 200, 200, no, that, uh, what would they be? About $280 a module, yeah. So the total cost of that 10 The total cost uh, was about $28,000, yes. What's the implication if you lose the grid power for a week? Uh, this particular system will shut down. Yeah, so if you're worried about power outages, you'd need some sort of storage like batteries, right? So, but if you're in an area like this particular system here is in a well-developed area that, you know, the, the power might go out one or two times a year. And this particular home does have a backup generator in place that they put in when they built the home too, right? But, yeah. Any government subsidies for this program? No, there is not uh, at this time. Um, uh, we do review that, like last time I reviewed it was probably in the fall, like all the different provinces. Um, and, and I should say there's no subject, like right now the government has mandated that the utilities do have to net meter uh, if you do put in a certain system. And the net metering is, I guess it's a sort of subsidization because if you do feed energy back out, you, you get the same amount of money uh, as you as you buy it from, right? So it can, these systems will, like when we do an economic analysis, this particular system over the, the life cycle of the system save the owner uh, about uh, $39,000. Yeah, so there is, and it's always a balance too, right? Because if you get too much grant money coming from government sources, then it's a huge rush to put the systems up, and then it's just, it's a big mess too, right? So, you know, we certainly want to see some sorts of incentive, right? So people see the value of putting these systems up, but it has to be balanced as well. And, and we find net metering actually works pretty good. Like once people see the numbers, once we go through and do an economic analysis, say, you know, this is how much energy you're producing, this is what you can feed back in, this is what you're going to save. You know, once people see the breakdown of the numbers, then, then it's like, well, this is, you know, this is economical, right? So, so in Alberta, they're paying you roughly the same amount. Yeah, trade. they will do that here too. No, actually, for this, <laughs> we have to beat up on them with the government a bit because they're only going to pay us just under three cents a, a kilowatt hour. And, well, and it depends how you're classified. You have to be classified as a, a net meter. Yeah. So you know there is different classes of of uh, solar. Or if you're doing, like, are you trying to integrate a solar system, or is it a different source? No, of it's just power? what they say on their actual website. Okay. Yeah, and if you look through, like, it's like if you look through like um uh yeah i guess i'd have to look up with fortis in in uh in bc i know like yeah. we've done a few systems under bc hydro and and they 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 will net meter right yeah. uh fortis in alberta i mean we have no problem right they they have to net meter with us um i would ch I, I would say it'd be the same for bc we haven't connected a system to fortis in bc but it's pretty much, the government has mandated like that they have to accept, as long as it meets code and it's within the definition of net metering, that they have to accept it, right? But there are like, if you try to uh, integrate like a, a backup generator, like just to purposely feed power, and if you put in a really big solar system just to feed power in as a, like a revenue source, then you wouldn't net meter and then you would have to sell it at a wholesale price, right? So it depends how it's classified, right? So, but if we set it up properly, then you can net meter and, and there's good savings there, so yeah. So how many years does it take for this to pay off to where you, you're at the break-even point? Uh, we find, uh, like in Alberta, with our utility prices, we're at about $0.09 cents per kilowatt hour right now. And with inflation, like in Alberta, the last 12 years, uh, powers went up 5.19% uh, a year. Um, so when we do the economic analysis factor in inflation and stuff like that, it's about uh, 15 years or so. 
So when we look at it, it is it's certainly a lot, like when we tell clients it's a long-term investment, um, and then we say, well, what's your alternative? If you just continue to pay your power bill every month, there's no return on that, right? That's just money out, out of your pocket, right? So, you know, you can, uh, you know, in, in the proper setup, you can invest some capital up front and it'll, it'll bring savings, right? And, and, uh, and how often would you have to replace a complete system? Uh, well, we don't, we haven't yet at all. Like, um, and like our modules, like we, we try to use the quality modules, like the Kia Sarah modules uh, that we spec, especially for off-grid. Um, they've proven the last, like Kia Sarah's been producing them and had them out there long enough that they've been proven the last 40 years already, right? And, and inverters, like uh, these inverters here, these are relatively new in the last about six years, like these micro inverters. But end phase, one of the reasons that we go with them is because they did extensive third party testing to do like accelerated life testing and stuff to, to prove that, you know, we're, have, we're providing a 25 year warranty and we want to back this up, right? So, um, you know, we don't know the lifespan of these. So it's, it's you know, we're going with all the third party testing that's been done and end phase's own testing and relying on that, right? Uh, as far as off grid, like the inverters, uh, if they're in a good clean environment, I mean, 20 years is, is quite easy because we, we replace inverters you know, that are 20, 25 years old that people are finally upgrading, right? And as long as they're in, in a clean environment and well ventilated, then they'll last, right? Because heat, heat, like with these inverters, um, these micro inverters, I mean, they, they have, um, they, they, they cool just by uh, um, um, convection. Uh, they just really, I mean, the, the heat just goes out into the air. Uh, with a larger central inverter, like what the museum has here, there's a, if the inverter gets up to a certain temperature, then fans come on and stuff, right? So uh, you want to make sure that, you know, all it's in a clean environment so the, uh, the filters and stuff don't get dirty and the inverter doesn't get hot because heat is, will really, really reduce lifetime, right? If stuff starts overheating. Um, so yeah, there's little things like that. So, you know, uh, like the off-grid inverters that have been around for, we've got good history on them, like 20 years is, is no problem. And we've had people get longer out of them, right? And a lot of people replace them like after 20 years before they actually fail, right? They're just old technology. They're not near as efficient as what the new ones are, right? So life is pretty good on them. Um, but yeah, these particular ones we're just going on and our, we haven't had any fail in, in, you know, all the ones that we have out there. So, you know, so far so good. Uh, this is another typical uh, ground mount. This is still a grid tie. So we can do uh, in, in rural areas where there's some space, uh, we'll do a ground mounted uh, grid tie system. Um, so this, you can just see the array, uh, aluminum racking and it's just mounted to a steel frame. Um, and this is one of our installed systems. And then it's nice and simple. The micro inverters are on the back. As you'll see here, you can see with the racking, the micro inverters are all just on the back there. And we just wrote that down to a, a disconnect because it's all AC coming from the uh, 8 kilowatt array. Uh, and it just comes in, we just bring it right into the meter base after this is a disconnect. So it comes up here where we can disconnect the whole system, turn it off um, if we have to. And then it just runs into the meter base and feeds the whole the whole property. There's a house and barn and other stuff. On the so the energy just goes wherever it's needed, and then if it's not needed on the property, it, it goes back in. So uh, this particular site here uh, with the eight kilowatt system, uh, that system installed um, yeah, was about $35,000. And uh, yeah, in the summer they enjoy having, they get credits on their bills come summertime. So it's actually, you know, it might be negative $20 and then that's carried over to the next month and so on and so forth. And as they get into the winter and they start using energy because the system, then they can use up those credits. And then when you net meter at the end of your calendar or anniversary date from when you install the system, if you still had a credit, then the utility does have to pay you out for that. So it's, uh, yeah, we get, we get people that, because when we size a system, when you net meter, you have to design it so technically you don't put in more power than what you're using. So we look at your power bills and stuff. Um, but the one thing people do is once they get a system in and they see, okay, I'm using, I'm making this much energy, I'm using this much, you know, how can I also reduce my consumption, right? And uh, once you have a system in place, like some people, we've had people cut their consumption in half and then their system is really overproducing, right? And uh, in that case, they can get a check every year, right? Because the government, or the utility, once the system's approved based on the criteria at the start, if you become more efficient, they can't tell you to stop using your system, right? So we have people that are, are getting checks every year from, from their utility and they basically are, are uh, you know, those help cover the fixed charges on your bills, right? So it's, uh, you know, they go from, uh, you know, we've had people go from spending, you know, $1,500 a year, uh, quite easy on utilities down to, you know, $100, $200 a year. And uh, yeah, so you get a lot of smiles when you're, when, when they're exporting power back out to the grid.
Uh, so this particular system here, this is another grid tie, but we actually, this system does have a, a battery based system in it, so even with a grid tie system we can run batteries. Um, and they chose to do this, like this system uh, is again uh, much more expensive than a system, uh, you know, battery based system is about twice as much as a, a grid tie system with no batteries, because you have different inverter, you have all your batteries. Um, so this particular client decided to spend more money with the battery based systems because they have a organic farm here uh, where they raise animals and also uh, uh, vegetables and stuff and they need a, you know, you know, if the power goes out in the area, which for them it does regularly, they need a power source to keep their lights on and keep stuff warm and whatnot, right? So uh, they put this system in place. So it is uh, six kilowatts as well, you know, the same same inverter system like this, uh, this battery based inverter system with a few touches of the buttons we can make it so it's off grid or it's utility interactive, right? So with the technology nowadays we can, there's so many options, right? So we set this one up so it, uh, it, it interacts with the utility and uh, it's still connected to the battery bank so this is the finished product after we installed it so in just an enclosed battery. Uh, they did uh, with this system, it is mounted on the outside, but they, uh, we installed venting to come from the inside to, into the back of the battery box to help keep it warm. And these batteries, uh, they stay at about uh, constantly between 18 to 23 degrees Celsius all year round, so uh, it's worked quite well. Do they ever freeze, yes. like if there's a real... Uh, batteries could freeze. The AGM batteries are quite resistant to freezing. Um, they would have to be discharged and it would have to be like minus 50 out for them to freeze. So uh, in most applications you don't have to worry about freezing batteries like for the standard application but they can freeze in the, the right environment, right? So. So yeah, they just connect up to the battery bank. If the power goes out from the utility, within about 16 milliseconds, the inverter system kicks in and provides power to everything that the system is designed to po provide power to, right? Excuse me? Yes. Is it, is it difficult or, um, to convert to a battery system after the fact, like five years? Uh, it's not difficult, but it, it takes a little bit. Like if you go with the micro inverters, to begin with, like just a batteryless system, uh, we have to end up, how are we doing for time? Uh, we're are we good? Yeah, the, okay, lots yeah. of time. Um, we we uh, we would have to install. So you have your micro inverters on the roof. We'd still have to install a, an, an inverter like this, and basically AC couple the system. So the system with the uh, micro inverters will charge through this system and charge your batteries and provide power. Um, so I mean, from a technical point of view, it's relatively easy, but it's going to cost you money. So it's, it's kind of better to decide that beforehand where, which route you want to go, because otherwise you're double paying for the inverter. Well, yeah, you're, you. Have two inverters in place, right? And and then that's you know because these units here with a central inverter, uh, you know they're quite costly. They're about I mean this unit with the two charge controllers, you know is about uh, you know eighty five hundred bucks, right? So it's not cheap, right? So you know that's that proper planning and design work at the beginning is really that's that's really the most important, right? Because if you do it right from the beginning, then then it can be you know quite economical. Would something like that though become less expensive five ten years from now? Uh, yeah, we're we're finding that I mean the cost for what you get has come down. Like this particular system, like because it provides 240 uh, with the integrated charge and stuff like this. Like about six years ago, to get this same type of capacity would have been about uh, uh, 12,500 so, so yeah, everything's coming down. Like the solar modules, like our Kyocera ones, that even on the higher end that are are about 380 bucks or so. Uh, five years ago, those were about 2,000 dollars each. So I mean the cost has come down dramatically. And, and uh, you know, with this technology. So how do I implement solar? So again, uh, you know, doing a site assessment, uh, part of the uh, planning process, like, uh, uh, I mean, whether you're, we're installing it or if you're installing it or if you have a contractor installing it, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, good to look at the site. You know, we can see, we came out here, we did a, you took a panoramic picture. We can see where the sun level, this is about uh, uh, noon at, uh, I'm just trying to think, because we write down all the data so we can calculate sun angle. I think it was about February 7th. And you can see the sun, it is above the horizon there but uh, in the middle of December when the the sun is at about its lowest point about 13 degrees they are going get to get a bit of shading across these mountaintops this isn't drum heller so they're they're down kind of in the hoodoos mm -hmm. so you can see where right now in February the sun's high enough 
that during, you know, you're going to get good sun on the roof, right? But in December, they are going to get a little bit of shading. Uh, but this particular system would be a grid tie system, so they're not too worried about a little bit of shading in December, right? It's, it's as long as it, you know, on a yearly basis, it, it, it does what it needs to do. Um, so we do a site assessment, we come out, we, you know, we get on the roof, we look, uh, we take pictures, we do, uh, you know, depending on the site, you know, we'll have our, our, our tools to measure shading from any obstacles. <coughs> And uh, you know we want to make sure that this you know you're actually going to get sun on the modules because if you don't have sun on the modules they're just a big object there doing nothing right so you want to make sure you have sun. Oh, we're going the wrong direction. Sorry. And again, just uh, checking the roof out, making sure this particular this is a typical residential. This is a metal roof. Um, and this particular roof, there's going to be about an 8 kilowatt system that will go on the roof. And you can see they have some trees on their property uh, that they're going to remove um, to ensure that there's good sun on the roof, right? So, you know, that's all part of the planning process to make sure that you have good sun. And then we actually have to get into the roof. Uh, we have to look at the trusses, record material, truss size, spacing. And that's all part of our engineering calculations to make sure that, uh, you know, you're, when you put solar on the roof that your roof's going to stay a roof and not collapse, right? So that's very important. And, uh, and then we've, we've uh, factor in routing. This particular home already had uh, some electrical coming down, so they actually had some openings that we were able to, uh, we will be able to run through, so that makes the job easier. And they already have some conduit in place, so we can run some additional conduit and strap it properly. So you know, that's all part of the process is planning to make sure, you know, how we route the cable down, all your infrastructure. And then we actually look at the breaker panel to make sure that your system can accept the power. Um, you know, it's uh, when you're off-grid, it's a little bit more simple because you're a closed entity, so we just make sure everything's right there. But when you're in a grid tie system, we're of course working with existing equipment, right? So, you know, we look at the size of your load panel, the size of the breakers, make sure you have some spacing for breakers. Um, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot to, to go through in each site. You know, that's why you have to do a site assessment on, on each one just to make sure that we know all the details and each system is, is worked out. So how much does this average system cost? Uh, these will just be some real basics. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, a few things. So yeah, like the off-grid systems, we, by far we get the most interest in off-grid systems. That's pretty much everyone's goal. If they don't have to have a utility, that would be fantastic, right? But it's not always practical or cost-effective either, right? So uh, we have to look at it, you know, do some calculations for you, work through you, build an energy budget, see, see what your costs are. And we certainly do get a fair amount of people that, you know, even though, you know, we can do a comparison between a grid tie system and an off-grid system if they want to go off-grid. And, you know, sometimes the off-grid system might work out right now to, you know, thirty or forty dollars a month more, uh, but just out of principle, they just want to be self-sufficient and, and go that route, so they'll do it, right? And and we're and, and a lot of it's a mind change. Like we're getting so many people. Like we get some people that you know they 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 call us and they're going over costs. Like oh, that's so expensive. And you know, you get talking to them and you know they have you know fifty thousand dollar fifth wheel in the driveway. Well, you know that's just a depreciating asset that you use for a month a year, right? If you can have that RV, you can definitely have a solar system, right? So it's all a mindset to how people look at this, right? Because when we break down the cost of the solar system, yes, it is a significant investment, right? But when we look at the life cycle cost, you know, and a lot of people's eyes get open. If we look at, okay, over 20 years, this is the cost of your system. If you have to pay your power bill for 20 years with inflation and they see that number all at once, it's like, oh, wow, I, if I don't have to give, you know, that much money to the utility and I can, you know, have my own system, then they, they like that, right? Yes. I'm curious about uh, troubleshooting and follow-up. Yes. Compared, if I install it or if you install it. Yeah, if we if we sell you uh, uh, like a complete system that we've we've worked with you to design and stuff, uh, I mean certainly yeah we're there for lifetime support. I mean there's no cost for troubleshooting and I mean if we have to come out to site there could be charges for that right. But as far as phone support any any work that we need to help you through there's there's no cost for that right. We do have to you know we certainly get some people that will um, you know not buy equipment from us and and we will provide you know if they need basic support I mean just as being you know. I mean, human, I guess, help them out, but I mean, also we reserve our, our, our expertise and stuff for, for those that support us too, right? But um, I mean, it's, so yeah, I mean, if you buy a system from us, uh, certainly we're there to support you.
make sure that it's up and working right. And, and uh, we, you know, we do have a reference list that we, we provide people that are looking for assistance so they can talk to past clients and you know, right. see how we follow up on that. But yeah, it's, it's pretty, I mean, the off-grid systems, grid tie systems are pretty basic. And we can, with the technology, like we can get with your grid tie system with the microwave inverters, we can get on there and, and look, because uh, uh, the system's monitored, right? So we can, part of building the grid tie system is we'll, we'll build it out and we actually register it with the manufacturer. And then we have an account for you where we can go on and see what each module is producing, what the inverter is doing. Uh, we can see line voltages, we can see frequency, you know, so that really helps for the troubleshooting part, right? Uh, for the, uh, uh, so for the grid tie system, there's really not too much to do, right? Like either it's working or it's not, right? There's really no in between. The off-grid systems, you know, even though we design a system and we can make it so it's automated, the generators start on their own stuff, you're still your own power producer, so you do have to take ownership of the system. You have to learn how it works. You have to be able to do basic stuff, right? Because, you know, if, if something, inevitably something happens, you know, maybe a, a breaker trips or whatever, and it's it maybe not a major issue, but you have to be able to go out there and figure out what happened. And, and uh, I mean, you can call us, we can walk you through it, but I mean, if we just have to come all the way out to check a breaker or something, I mean, you're gonna, depending how far it is, you can get a couple hundred dollar bill just to flip a switch, right? So you have to make sure you take ownership of the system when it's off grid and, and, and understand the basics, right? So you can you can be that, because if the power goes out, you know, with the off grid systems, when they're designed right and the proper equipment, it doesn't happen, it's very rare, right? Like it's, they're quite reliable but I mean it usually will happen at some point you know something happens you have to be able to reset something or what have you and the off-grid system the light goes out you're the first I mean instead of calling the utility you're it's you you got to go out there and kind of figure out what's going on right and so do you provide some basic training when you install a system I mean basic training basic yeah we uh, the, 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 the best thing is when we were talking to someone about implementing a system uh, we do a lot of screening ahead of time so that really rules out we can tell quite quickly if, if right. A, a off-grid system would be kind of something that you it would be a good idea for you or not, right? right. And then certainly um, uh, we do provide some training, and I mean there's manuals and documents we go through and do that for you. And then yeah, I mean there's a lot of we provide a lot of documentation too, right? Like you can come to our facility, and we can go over product beforehand, uh, do some training that way, right? And, mm -hmm. and then certainly there is some reading involved. You get you have to get to know your system and just be out there with it when it's working, right? So yeah, it take we we usually find for someone to settle in like with an off-grid system, it's about a year. Like, to get totally to figure out all its intricities, how each one is working, right? And, and because each system is a little bit different, right? How you use your energy, when you use it, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? But yeah, the off grid system is definitely, it's a whole new level. You do have to take a bit of ownership to it, right? And, and uh, but yeah, well designed system, like, there really are, you know, we don't have, we don't have anyone. I mean, for us to have to do service calls are quite rare, right? Like it doesn't happen. <laughs> okay. So it, it's nowhere. Yeah. So it it's pretty good, right? Like it's. Um, and I would say, I mean, we get a good chunk. You know, 80% of our clients. I mean, they don't. You know, for years and years on end, it just keeps going. They'll do their yearly checks in the spring and fall to make sure everything's tight, right? And mm -hmm. open up your combiner boxes, make sure none of the breakers are tripped for any weird reason or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they're they're very reliable on balance. So yeah. Okay. On an off-grid system, are you better off running your DC power the distance or your AC power the distance? Uh, now, like from the arrays and stuff, like it depends where you're running DC from, like at, at what voltage, right? But uh, we would, uh, typically it's always better to run AC at distance if you have to, right? And then now it, it's best to have, you know, before the inverters came down and cost and efficiency went up and stuff, I mean, a lot of people would wire a cabin or what have you for DC, right? But now it's gotten to the point where, you know, it's just more economic to implement an inverter system and wire a building standard AC, right, and yeah. deal with it that way. And then we can calculate with the solar modules now, we can, we can our standard configuration with the solar modules, and we bring the DC in at about anywhere between, it, it'll fluctuate depending on how much stuff's loaded, but it'll come in between 90 and 110 volts DC, and then come into the system and then step down to the voltage for the batteries or be converted to AC, right? So, but yeah, if you have to typically, if you want to move power at great distance, the AC is better than DC, yeah. So all other things being equal, if I have a choice between mounting it on my roof or mounting it on a stanchion in my yard, which is yeah. expensive. We would recommend uh, mounting on the ground, because uh, the big thing is just uh, roof mounting. I mean, with building permits, uh, engineering reports, um, we do have, uh, like our, our stamp drawings are pretty standard, like if for just for a standard residential roof that most u utilities or, or um, uh, permit issuing offices will accept is okay, you know, we know that this roof's gonna be okay, but 
uh, you know, if it's a commercial building, like let's say it's an out building, it's a, uh, a shop or something, and we don't have standard, you know, two by fours at two feet. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be two by sixes at four feet. You know, and then the uh, the code issuing, uh, they want uh, an engineering report on that, right? And and usually, like at minimum, do an engineering report is about twenty five hundred dollars plus travel time, right? So you know, that can add up quite quick if you want to mount it on your roof. And so those are all the things we have to balance, right? And and two, when it's on the ground, it's easier to access, right? You can check the bolts, make sure everything's tight, you know, once or twice a year, right? And just make sure that stuff working properly, right? So you can access it. And, you know, because when the system's on the roof, we would, you know, you can use a roof rake to clean it off, but we wouldn't recommend getting up there um, just because we don't want anyone to fall off, right? And, and uh, so it's, you know, if they're on the ground, they're easier to work with. If you have the space, then they, you get about 15% more output on the ground too because you have better cooling, right? So uh, there's definitely noticeable differences between roof mounting and ground mounting. What's, what's the distance, sort of the maximum distance from if you're ground mounted? back into the house or to the, uh, to the building, like how far away can it be? Yeah, um, it just depends on, on like if you're if it's uh, AC or DC, or, and then we just have to you know do the proper wire sizing and stuff like that, right? So I mean we can run you know hundreds of feet no problem, right? And I mean even further, it's just a matter of making sure you plan wire sizes properly and, and stuff like that, right? So yeah, yes. I think you already answered this, but I forgot. With the tying system when the power goes out. What's the deal? If, if you have no batteries, it will shut down. Right away? Yes, and that's cold, right? Because if your okay. system kept operating while uh, line power is down, your system would actually feed power back into the grid and electrify the lines that are supposed to be dead, right? So if your utility worker you know, grabbed right. onto that, they would soon find out that it was live, right? So yeah, like uh, our, our code requires that it shuts down, yeah. Okay, so, so that's the bugger. There's my freezers, right? Yes, ah. yes. And then, so that, you know, that, that's the cost balance, right? Because if we're looking at, you know, like a, uh, if we're looking at a, at a, a grid tie system, an off-grid system or battery-based grid tie system, uh, you know, the, with no batteries, it's going to be close to half the cost as, as a battery-based system. So, you know, you know, if you get power outages regular or if you have stuff that's critical, then the cost is justifiable. You know, if it's, if the power goes out a couple times a year for a couple hours, it's really not yeah. that big of a deal, right? So, Thanks. Yeah. Let's see what's on the next slide here. Uh, Off-grid uh, off system. Yeah, so this is talking about averages again. So we have a six kilowatt PV system, uh, six kilowatt uh, uh, inverter system, and eight, eight and a half kilowatt generator system. Uh, so this is good for about 15 kilowatt hours per day. So again, uh, you know, we look at your consumption because with this solar system, like a six kilowatt system is going to produce, you know, about 30 kilowatt hours per day in the summer. But in the winter, you're about a third of that, right? And then we average it out for your consumption so we can, you know, work with averages and figure out what's best for uh, on a daily basis year round, right? And then, uh, so this particular system, so our standard system is, uh, what did it come around to? The total system cost is roughly $273 a month. Uh, or 50.6 cents per kilowatt hour. So that $273, you know, that's factored over a 21 year life cycle cost. So that takes into account, we average stuff out. So you have your module life cycle cost, you have your inverter life cycle cost, and your batteries, uh, which are all different. But that, that, when we average everything together, it comes out to a 21 year lifespan. And uh, so when we look at, uh, uh, you know, your cost, and that includes with the backup generator, uh, that includes, that assumes you're using a diesel gen set uh, that we would supply because we know, like the Kubota units that we know, we know the life cycle that they last for, uh, and we also know the fuel consumption that they use, right? So if you if you stay to your proper consumption, we can calculate well, how, roughly how much fuel you're going to burn every year, and we can plug all those numbers in to get a cost <coughs> for you, right? So... And uh, and then the total upfront investment uh, uh, with installation is forty six thousand dollars. So you know you can see there is uh, you know a significant uh, upfront investment, but uh, you know when you start looking at it over over time, you know that's the thing with solar is it's you're basically buying energy all at once. If you had to if you had to buy twenty years of utility power tomorrow, it would be expensive too, right? If they mm -hmm. factor in inflation and everything else, right? So it's it's all how you look at. It. So we break it down. You know we show you your initial cost. We break it down. We amortize the system over. Its, life cycle costs, you know, we can kind of figure out, uh, you know, we can plug in different numbers to give you, try to give you a good representation of how much the system's going to cost uh, for you. Just out of curiosity, with technology changing so fast, I didn't, on your solar arrays, I didn't notice if they were a whole unit or you can change them individually. Say you came up with much better solar panels, 
right? Yeah. You have to go, yeah. Hey, you know, what about these? You know? Yeah, you, there are some limitations because, like, the inverse, everything's designed to work together, right? right. So as the modules change, like, if, if the voltage of the modules change <laughs> and stuff like that, then it can affect all the equipment down the line, yeah, right? So um, it, I guess the answer to that is it depends, right? Like, depending on the equipment, it could be easy. Otherwise, it could be, it may not work at all. Otherwise, you'd have to change out everything downstream, right? So, okay. yeah. So it, 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 yeah, it just all depends, right? And it, it's kind of one of those things. So we get, you know, quite a few people that, uh, you know, that, oh, uh, you know, maybe I'll wait until next year until the cost comes down. And, I mean, you can play that game. I mean, it's like personal computers. It's like tablets. It's like, I mean, my phone that I got two years ago is, I mean, it's long outdated now, right? So it's, kids wouldn't use it. Now. Yeah. That's a, I mean, so it's like that thing with everything. Yeah. Kim, don't forget that particular scenario in, in, in has the generator in there. That's right. Which is only for crucial situation. You don't need that. That generator can come out of that price. If you want. Yeah, that's right. That This includes installation and a generator price, right? right? And, and so this would be what we would consider a full time system. We're using it year round and uh, and uh, so you need power year round and you have a backup generator in place, right? Like if it's seasonal or, you know, some people, we can tell you how much the solar system is going to produce every month, you know, with quite accuracy, right? So we can look through, when we do our economic and performance analysis, we show you, okay, this is how much the system is going to produce in January, February, March, April, May. You know, and some people that are, are really motivated, they say, well, we'll just reduce our consumption in the winter if they have a wood burning stove and they can turn out the lights and what have you, right? And, and then they don't need a generator, right? That, that generator may never start the entire it, it could if you're if you're really diligent, right? So yeah, those are all the. Would that be an off-grid system? This would be an off-grid system, yeah. So um, yeah, so that and, and with an off-grid system, yeah. So this includes the generator cost. So that's all the things that you have to factor in, right? Like you know, just the solar system is certainly much less than that, right? If you install it yourself and all that kind of stuff. Right? So, yes. So the basic cost of that system you're saying is 273 a month. Uh, that that includes the generate like generator and fuel costs and everything. Yeah. So if you're not using 273 a month, that doesn't really. Yeah, like if you're already onto the utility, then that's something you have to look at. Like, do I really want to go completely off grid? This type of scenario would be for someone if, if they have to bring in power, if they have to spend twenty grand to bring in power, and mm -hmm. then you have your power bill with all your line charges and everything. Well, if you have, if you if you can save twenty grand bringing in power, and then your power bills for the rest of your life, then this kind of system becomes justifiable, right? And becomes cost effective. Mm -hmm. But you're, if you're already on the utility, then this might not be a system for you, right? Because it could be, it could be more costly, right? So you know, whereas a, a grid ties, like if you're already on the utility, then a grid Tie system might be the best route to go, right? So I heard someone might have had a question here earlier. Just started to speak, or no? Another thing, too, is yeah. at the, to answer that gentleman's question over there for the distance for the yes, you can have them solar panels miles away, and you can calculate the load. Yeah, you can, and you can use transformers, and you can get into a lot of stuff to move voltages around, right? So yeah, you can you can. I mean, you can really run as far as you want. It's just a matter of how we do it and the cost and stuff, right? I mean, ideally, if you can keep your infrastructure as close as possible, that'll work out the best, right? So, are you in trouble if you get a week of cloudy weather? Uh, yeah, like if you don't have a backup source, like a backup generator, and depending on the size of your batteries, you could be, right? So, you know, and we have when we do the design process, like you can't just have a big battery bank and a small solar array because that battery bank's not going to get charged properly and it's going to fail quite early, right? So, you know, there's a lot of design aspects around it. So, you know, we find usually, like if, if you're a pretty light user, uh, you know, and you want two or three days of storage so we keep everything balanced, then, you know, just a small, you can have a small, like, you know, Honda, you know, three or four thousand watt inverter or generator inverter that you just plug in right and that would save a lot of cost right but I mean we we technically we can size a system and do anything you want if you're willing to open your wallet right like we can make a, a bank last for two weeks if we want right so but you have to have the proper solar size with that and everything else right so so yeah but yeah if you, if, if you only have three days of storage and it's cloudy for a week yeah the power could go out if you don't have a backup generator I heard somewhere that the, pole, the panels can charge even if it's cloudy well, they still do when it's cloudy, but like it, it, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's linear, but it's, you know, it, we find usually like if you, if you get, if it's sun with like rolling clouds or so, you're still going to get about 60%, 70% of its output, right? If it's a socked in, like real cloudy, like there's fog right in on the panels, I mean, you're down to probably 10% or so. So it just depends, but they will produce on a cloudy day for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and in the summer, even if we get like no sun, uh, like if there's no sun shining through, but it's a night, like the sun's nice and high in the summer, and it, and uh, you know you can still get 50% output, wow. you know, without direct sun. But yeah, they are reduced with with cloud cover. Yeah, but uh, you won't like during the day, you won't get zero. So 
You still get something, so. Still running your lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, we'll flip over to a uh, grid tie system with no battery. So this is a smaller four kilowatt system, which is pretty typical for residential uh, system uh, size. So this system will generate about uh, 14 kilowatt hours a day. Uh, so again, we'd look at your power bill and see how much you're using and so on and so forth. Uh, so the uh, the average uh, uh, life uh, life cycle of a grid tie system is 32 years. You know, with, with having the uh, micro inverters with the warranty that they have no batteries, that really extends the life cycle time of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have that. So uh, typical um, uh, 14 kilowatt system. Uh, our four kilowatt system is seventeen thousand dollars plus tax, and that's installed. So that's typically what we install a four kilowatt system for, and uh, and that would produce uh, that would produce energy at about ten cents per kilowatt hour. And that particular system, if you if you have this is based on Alberta utility rates too. So if we're, and we're at about nine cents per kilowatt hour right now, so over thirty two years, that system would save you about thirty three thousand uh, dollars gross. So you would net out at about uh, twelve thousand dollars savings with that system. Um, which I mean, otherwise, you know, you'd spend thirty-three thousand dollars over those thirty-two years on power, right? So, it's uh, you know, there is certainly savings to the system if you're able to, you know, to to look after the upfront costs. So, yes. What did you say about an inexpensive Honda generator? If the power went out, I still have to have batteries, wouldn't I? Oh yeah, you would. I'd have to have batteries. Yeah, yeah. We're just talking about instead of having like an expensive like diesel gen set or something that's like a permanent installation, you could just go with a basic plug-in like a portable one. Uh, if you think that you'd only need it a few times a year. But right? you still need to have, buy batteries. Yeah, you still need to buy batteries. Yeah, yeah. So th this particular system right here, if the power goes out, your system goes down too, right? So you're in the dark. And and I mean, you can have a like an inverter or um, a generator uh, into the sit like for your home to provide backup power. Uh, we can integrate a, a solar system with that so um, it would be separate but it would still power the home right so you could still have a home that has a backup generator and a, a grid tie system with no batteries but the uh, the generator wouldn't the system would still be shut down when the generator is running right and, and we just have to make sure that's done right but you can still have a backup source but uh, when you have a grid tie system but yeah and what, what's the price then? If we did the back, if we had the uh, a typical, you know, like a, a Kohler standby backup generator, we don't sell them, but I mean, we we're in contact them a lot. They're about sixty five hundred bucks. And that would be like an eight to ten kilowatt backup uh, generator that's that's designed to back up your whole home kind of thing. So it comes with a transfer switch and stuff like that, right? So. But would she not have to have a a special breaker that would trip her paddle? Yeah, so what we have to do is like your your uh, generator has a, a, a transfer switch, right? So it is isolates from the generator, but yes, and you're right. So when we install a, a inverter sys or a solar system with a backup generator, uh, we actually have to use a latching relay with the solar system. So it automatically disconnects, but you need to manually reconnect it. Because if you have the generator running and one of these systems running at the same time, the generator and the solar system are going to bunt heads and you're going to get smoke coming out of something, right? So we have to make sure that we, uh, we have to... Because if we don't have the latching relay in there when the generator comes online, because the way that the micro inverters operate is they sense they sense line voltage coming through the power lines, right? So uh, if the backup generator comes online, then the inverters are going to want to come online, right? But we have to make sure that we disconnect those inverters so they can't come on when the backup generator is running. And then as soon as the utility power goes back on, uh, you just go down and push a button on the relay and then it reconnects the solar, right? So that's something that we have to consider too. Yep. Yep. Excuse me? Yes. Okay, so this four kilowatt system would provide here about 4,400 kilowatt hours per year, right? It was. Uh, no, it would provide. You'd be close here. You'd be. You'd be. You'd do pretty good here too. I would have to run the numbers, but this one, like in Alberta, it provides 13.8 kilowatt hours a day. Uh, I would say here you'd be definitely no, at least per, on average you'd be 10 kilowatt hours a day in per BC. year on a per year basis. Oh, on a per year, so yeah. 10 kilowatts times. Uh, the PV potential here is about 1,100. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah we look. Um, I don't look at the, I, we don't use the maps, like the general, I, we actually have access, uh, NASA has a database for, then they have, um, they have uh, weather stations all over the globe that measure solar insulation, so uh, I don't have the, av I don't look at the average for yearly, we look on a daily basis and stuff, but mm -hmm. yeah, so I mean, you'd be, I don't have my calculator on me, but if you did 10 kilowatt hours a day times 365, so I mean, you're about 3,065 kilowatt hours or 3.6 megawatt hours a, mm -hmm. a year. So that would be, you know, it would come out, you'd be, 
Yeah, so I don't know, do you roughly know what you use for electricity every month in yeah. kilowatt hours? What do well, you use? In six months I used 8,800 kilowatt hours. Okay. But, uh, okay, so, so with this particular system, this is a four kilowatt system. Yeah. Um, for, how much did you say? 17,000? 17, yeah. To add another four kilowatts. Yes. In yeah, the, it, it's in not double, like the cost goes down as we can scale, right? So, right. you know, like a, a 10 kilowatt system, for example, installed is about 35, right? So, you know, you get, uh, you know, you get uh, almost three times as much more for only twice as much as you, you go up, right? So, yeah, it's not linear. It does, it does, uh, you know, the larger system it is, the cheaper it is uh, per watt. Why, why 35? That last system was 28. Just different. Uh, the 35 would be installed. Like if you're just to buy like a 10 kilowatt system, it'd be 28. Oh, so that one system that you showed on the house that was 28,000. That didn't include installation. No, the 28 would just be. We did install that system, so it, the full full installation, like the full system with installation. Uh, I think it, yeah, it came to just over 35,000. It was a little bit more, maybe 36, because that particular system did have a ra uh, uh, latching relay in it, because it did have a backup generator. And stuff so we had to do some rewiring with that but but yeah because I mean we get some people that choose just to buy the system from us or they want it fully installed right so you know the numbers can kind of jump around so what would you charge to come and do a survey uh, a survey uh, all the way out to here would be well we'd have to look at the, the mileage and stuff but we we can typically do um, if you send us pictures, we can do, like we can have you do, because when we do a solar uh, survey or assessment, it's pretty much just kind of grunt work and there's not too much to it to start. So, I mean, if you can take pictures of your roof, uh, you know, your electrical panel, you know, we can send you a, a sheet that you can fill out. We can help you just for the data that we need. Um, you know, we can work, that's how we do most of it, because most of it, I mean, we do a lot of systems, you know, that are further than a couple hours from our facility to drive and do site assessments would just be too costly. For, for everyone involved, right? So we can get you to do a, a, a solar survey. Like we can tell, like if you take a picture facing south, we can tell right away if there's gonna be issues with shading with either natural objects or buildings or what have you, right? Because we've done enough systems that, I mean, we can tell right away if stuff's gonna work or not, right? And, and sometimes if it's close, like, yeah, I mean, we might have to do a, a survey and actually take, you know, see if there's gonna be some shading a certain time of year, but for 90% of the stuff, you can just send us pictures and we can work through it and, and tell you if it's gonna work or not and get you some pricing and stuff so if you take pictures of your roofing system like I showed on here we can figure out the type of trusses you have in the roof and, and go from there so yeah do you guys do solar only or do you guys do yeah solar just, power? just solar only we did wind power years ago and it just it wasn't a reliable option from equipment and and uh, you there's only certain par pockets in, in really Canada like certain areas that get decent wind it's not we don't get too much wind in this country uh, as uh, on a whole right so so it does it depends. have to have a certain wind speed to actually power the batteries then? What's that, sir? Does it have to have a certain wind speed yeah, to the, power the, the batteries? Yeah, the, the wind turbines do it. If you really look at the spec sheets on wind turbines, like a lot of them will say they'll start off at like, you know, 15 or 17 uh, kilometer an hour wind speeds, like they'll start producing energy, which is not too bad. Like that wind speed's not that bad. but. If you look at the spec sheet, that would only be a fraction of what they're capable. Like if you look at most small wind turbines, their full outputs at about like 35 km hour wind speeds as well. I mean, if you're in an area that has 35 km hour wind speeds, you probably wouldn't want to live there to begin with, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be very windy, right? Like it'd be, wind, it'd be uncomfortable, right? So, you know, that and that's the downside with turbines. If it's windy enough, you just don't want to be there, right? So, I know a lot of people live in Lethbridge already. The grid pipe system, you said that if the, the power from Fortis goes down, that there's no power at all. Yes. But is there other options other than a generator? Uh, you could put in a battery based system, but again, it's just if you're willing to pay for the extra for that type of system, right? So so basically we can do what it'd be like an off-grid system, but we can just set it up to be utility interactive, right? So you basically be buying an off-grid system. Uh, it wouldn't be quite as expensive because if you're just doing a backup system, you don't have to have as much batteries and stuff. If it's just to get you through, you know, like a day or something instead of several days. Um, but yeah, the option is either to have a backup generator that we isolate like from the, the PV system or you put in a battery batteries right so yeah so it's only we only recommend if you really need power for whatever reason you know if it's critical and the power goes out right otherwise it's hard to justify the cost yeah I think you mentioned something about uh, that the bigger the system 
Yeah. It'll bring down the unit per unit cost? Yes, yeah, for sure. Would that hold true for, say, a larger commercial operation? It will. At some point, more? yeah, at some point, like, once we jump from residential to commercial, like, there is a spike because there's a lot of, a lot more engineering and design work goes into the commercial system. So it almost looks like, I mean, you start up here with a residential system that comes down and down, and then once you get to a certain size, it spikes up again, right? Because there's a lot more technical work that goes into it. But then as you scale on the commercial size, then it comes down again, right? So, I mean, just for us to do an engineering analysis and, and uh, like, if we do a large commercial, like, let's say there's 30 kilowatts of solar, 40 kilowatts on a roof, uh, I mean, it's... It, it can be ten thousand dollars just to analyze the roof and make sure that it's not going to cave in, right? Like the solar can sit on the roof, um, so there is that. I mean, it it all depends on the size and your your application, right? But yeah, on a whole, as stuff gets larger, it does get cheaper, right? But there's those kind of individual, or you know, when it kind of jumps around a bit, but yeah. <laughs> There's no one concrete answer, no. I guess. Every, you know, everything has to be looked everything at individually, right? So, yeah. yeah. If you like, Caleb, you, you could uh, tell the crowd here uh, what the system is that we're, that we're putting in here. You betcha. Because it's a this is a, a commercial system. Okay, yeah. And what, and what we're doing, what, what we're going to power with it. You betcha. So yeah, this particular system here that uh, that the museum is implementing, it's a 12, it has a 12 kilowatt PV system, uh, so it's relatively large for the off-grid size. Uh, it has a six kilowatt inverter system, and then a uh, oh, you guys are about 80 kilowatt battery storage. So there's 32 six volt batteries, and it's uh, it's it's going to power well the new building that's going up plus more, and there's a heat pump in there, there's lights, there's there's, uh, you know, there's some other loads, and it's it's from spring to fall right now. That's how we size the system. So, uh, working with Cliff, uh, we we basically did an energy budget like we talked about. We went back and forth, and it took a while because we looked at different lights, and it was an involved process. So Cliff Cliff knows what's all involved with the energy budget. Like we went back and forth for a couple months, uh, working through this out and figuring stuff out. Again, it's that whole planning stage, and uh, laying everything out and figuring out energy consumption, and if you need to run it in the winter, if you don't, right? Because Again, we're looking at the amount of sun that Grand Forks gets, so we can calculate, you know, this is how much energy each month. So they're, they're going to have 48 modules mounted up in the, on the bank over there. And if you want, we can even kind of do a walkthrough, right? I mean, we can go look if, if that's... Well, I would, yeah, I was going to suggest that once, you, once you're done with your presentation, okay. if uh, you and, and uh, Mike want to take, take everybody out and show them what we're going to do out there, you betcha. and while you're out there, we'll set up tables, and then you can come back in and have lunch. Okay. Can we get Cliff to explain why we went with solar on this project? The reason we went with solar on this project, like Caleb was saying, over the 21-year period, this system to install it cost us sixty thousand dollars over the same 21 year period taking it off the grid was going to cost us eighty three thousand dollars not figuring in uh, inflation and that's why that's why we went with with uh, and it was going to be twenty thousand dollars just to get it the power to the building just to get the power to the building yeah so we've you know we factored in that plus your you know that how much energy they're projected to use right and you know all that kind of stuff right so we worked through with cliff with all those numbers right and, and provided uh, you know the cost for the off-grid system right so so yeah and, you know and that's why you know it, it's on a, each on a on an individual basis to basis right because uh you know, like in this application, it made sense, right? But some others have been not, right? So you look at each one individually, right? The, the system oh, here sorry. is going to will power this this building that we've we've got started now, and the overhead lighting in that is LED lighting. Those lights are again somewhat more expensive, but they mimic daylight. So. On the, the halogen lights that uh, we had looked at to start with, we needed 20 halogen lights to give proper lighting in, in that 1,600 square foot building. With these lights, we only need 10. And that uh, the system is also going to power a heat pump. So we've got heat uh, in the uh, summer, late summer, early spring, uh, when we... Uh, when we're using the building, and also air conditioning in the in the summertime, 
that building it was, it was designed to add another 60 feet onto the other end of it, another 2,400 square feet we want to put on. And this system will, will more than power both those buildings. We'll have some extra power left over. Yeah, and, and that's something to important to remember because when we went through the sizing process, uh, you know, they, they decided to go with the system right now, do it all, install it all at once. That's going to provide enough power for the addition to the building, right? Because they come back, you know, in, in another couple of years and add more to it and do kind of stuff you know, 50% of the stuff over again adds a lot of labor cost, right? So, you know, they did all now, it's all in place, then they can just add to the building and you have sufficient energy there for, for that, right? So, yeah. So the new system is for the new building and its extension, not this building? No. 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 And it, it, it will have a battery? Yeah, yeah, there'll be, there'll be, everything's still kind of packaged right now, but even one thing I was just thinking maybe later in the summer, if you guys do an open house or whenever it's installed, you know, we can, you can keep me in, in, in the loop because then maybe I can come out again and then we can do a walkthrough when the system is in place, right? Our plan at the present time is to have a grand opening for the building and the solar system toward the end of June. Okay. Yeah. Then we'll have, uh, <laughs> we'll have a, a, a grand opening for the for the whole work, gotcha. and then we'll just we'll throw it wide open to the public come yeah. and see what we got. Yeah, yeah. Keep me in the loop because I'll try to come out again, and then we can kind of do another one of these, right? Well, it's then people can actually see the equipment up on the wall and <coughs> that kind yeah. of stuff, right? I, I, excellent. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. So, yes. do you suggest LED lighting then for for the light bulbs and stuff, or or what? Yeah, LED lighting. Um, it, it depends. Like uh, LED, it's a lot more efficient. So you're going to realize really good gain from LED if it's a lighting application that that runs all the time, right? So like with the museum, with the lights being on for a good portion of the day, I mean, LED was an excellent way to go, right? Like if you have, you know, like a, a closet or, or a bathroom where the lights are only on maybe an hour a day, then, you know, does it, do you want to invest in the cost for that, right? Like it, it just depends on which route you want to go, right? Because, you know, like, uh, you, Definitely, if you're using lots of lighting, LED is a no-brainer. Right? Like it will save you money, and it you know it's much more efficient. Right? Like the halogen lights we're looking at used 80% more power. Right? Like it was a big difference. Right? So if those lights are on all the time, then it makes a huge difference. Right? If it's just a light that's on for half an hour a day, or it's really not gonna make much of a difference. And the right? halogen bulbs they produce a bit of heat yeah. too. Don't well, they? and that, that's where most of the energy is going is the yeah. heat, right? And so, the LED doesn't have it. No, no. Cause an LED is basically a solar module in reverse. We get we get it, uh, the sun shines on, on the solar modules, like the semiconductor, which is silicone, and a few other things to get the proper uh, conduction and your your uh, uh, electrons and protons, and and um, and then the LED, and then you get energy flowing back to wherever it needs to go. Well, an LED just works in reverse. You just supply power to the uh, semiconductor, and it gives off light, right? So basically, and, and solar modules will will actually do that. Like if we were like with the uh, the charge controllers, they 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 uh, they at night they they disconnect from uh, the array because if you left the battery bank connected to the array at night the array would suck that energy back and you the mo modules would actually glow at night <laughs> and uh, like we've seen that happen with charge controllers that fail like the modules will be glowing like because that's the energy coming from the bank through the module basically in reverse right so you know that's basically an LED and a solar solar cell are the same thing they just work in, in different ways so yeah okay. awesome have you ever had any instances where the, the battery banks have gotten overheated for some reason? Uh, not not with the proper equipment in place because everything's temperature regulated, right? Like with the with the system, there's a temperature sensor built in, so it regulates the battery temperature. But that's a very real concern. If you don't have the proper regulation, you could have a battery explode if you heat it up too much, right? So, and that would be not a good thing. Are you allowed to? Uh, like I know with the original Bakelite batteries, if you put them on cement, they would bleed back through the cement. Are uh, these new batteries, do they do that as well? Or should you have them up on a wood base? Yeah, well, yeah, you definitely want to, and all batteries hold true. And the reason that they, they discharge like that is is because uh, from the cement, the cement was a lot colder than the air temperature. Uh, so then uh, when you get the bo bat bottom half of the battery that's cold, uh, it just creates, battery temperature differences cause the battery to discharge. So right now, like if you set any battery on a, on a uh, even like the AGMs on a cold cement floor, they will discharge quicker just because they get cold. 
um, but that's that, there was never any conduction or like electricity transfers just because of the temperature, right? So yeah, you definitely want to like if you have batteries, you want to keep them like in an enclosure where you know it's, it's even temperature around the battery. Because if you do get uneven spots, it does discharge the battery quicker. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions or? Yeah. Oh. Okay. If I live up by the mountain and yep. I'm shaded from well, what the 20th November to the 20th January, there's no sun at all. Yeah. Is it going to have enough energy in there to keep it? Yeah, and then the, and, the, and that's where you'd have to have like some sort of like if you don't have the utility there and you want to be off grid, you'd have to have some sort of backup source like a generator or something, right, to help supplement that. You know, because to, to implement a battery bank, you know, to get you through that time period would just not be feasible, right? So you'd have to have some sort of, and that's pretty common for BC. I mean, we have to work with that rice shading in the winter. So you know, there can be if you're in the mountains somewhere through the winter months, you could be your 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 ch charge source is a generator, right? But if the system's designed right and you have a good good efficient like a diesel gen set uh, you know that and it runs uh, you know our, our typical off-grid systems the diesel uh, the diesel gen set will only run about 500 hours a year so it's not a tremendous amount it's every day but with the proper bank size in there and the regulation like it's not too bad right so uh, but that's a reality if you don't get any sun then yeah you have to have some sort of other charge source and those glass panels how would they take the, the dust that comes off the fields yeah that, the dirt. that it's dirt yeah, and that's a concern too. So I mean, if you're in an area that's quite dry, like you don't get too much humidity, then you'd have to wash them off, right? Um, in many locations, like especially in Alberta, we get enough enough rain, except for some part in southern areas where where most of the time they self-clean just with the weather, right? But yeah, if you notice, and that's part of just watching your rain, checking it, right? Like if you do notice the dirt build up on there, you definitely would want to wash it off. You can just hose them down. You can just hose them down, yeah, yeah pressure wash them or just take a garden hose and it's just it's just like rain just rinse them off and then it just all and they're sealed off. right so yeah oh yeah they're fully sealed yeah there'd be no issues there if we used to, if, we, if we had to use our own water to wash them off and it's really hard water mm -hmm. and it built up a you know, yep. deposits it's a problem yeah because that is a problem in this area okay yeah i mean that's that's um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, any, anything that sits on the, the, the module that, that reflects sun away from instead of letting it go through the glasses, you know, reduces your production, right? So you might, I mean, uh, next thing, if you do have hard water, you could just have like a squeegee on a, on a telescoping pole and just dry them off as soon as you rinse them, right? And then you don't get the mineral deposits. Yeah. A little bit of vinegar, you can't pour it. Well, if that's everything, we can maybe, we'll go cleaning almost maybe like have that. a look and... Okay, yeah, if, if uh, you and Mike want to take take everyone out there and show them what, what uh, we got planned for out there, and then we'll set up the tables and then... Can we just have a couple people just to help us set up the tables quickly? No, we got our own. We got enough people? Yeah, we got our own. Okay. And then we'll come back, come back in, we'll have a chili luncheon, it's uh, both vegetarian and meat. Mm -hmm. In a certain sequence to get proper voltage to, Our to come back. Our dose panel. How efficient? These ones are about, uh, uh, when they're warm and stuff, they're about 17.5%. 17 17 yeah, yeah. So they'll, like, because the sun puts off uh, about 1,000 watts per square meter. Uh, so these will generate about, uh, you know, 170 watts per square meter right now, right? So, yeah. Is that an inverter on there? Uh, yeah, there'll be an inverter back here. We can kind of spin around and have you guys look through. But yeah, this is what the solar modules look like. So it's a, it, it is a tempered glass. They're they're really uh, robust. They're meant to take uh, like a one inch hailstone at uh, 50 miles an hour, like a direct perpendicular hit. So they're very very reliable. The good modules, like the Kia Sera ones, have the the cross members in here uh, just to help with stability, like when you're in the wind and, and stuff That's like that. The That's angle that you're using. Uh, they will be, we'll show you where they're mounted here, but for the most part, they'll be quite shallow here because they're just using from spring into fall right now, right? So they'll be kind of the angle of the bank, right? So it's, that's probably about 15 degrees or so, right? So it's not, uh, not too steep right now, but. Yeah. So this is the this is a six volt battery. 
So they'll have 32 here that'll be uh, be orientated and placed in there where, where it'll work out for them. But yeah, just a standard deep six volts. So there's nothing too exciting about that, but that's what they look like. <laughs> Are they the maintenance free or? They are the maintenance free, so yeah, you can't even access the caps. They're, they're sealed. The caps are designed for, you know, if something went wrong with the equipment, they would, these caps would pop up instead of the battery, you know, getting too hot and exploding, right? But but yeah, other than that, they are uh, uh, fully sealed and maintenance free. Yeah. 115 pounds. They're not light, that's Oh. All right, so we might have to, uh, you can maybe just file through single file, but this is what their inverter system looks like. So we pre-assembled it, uh, we pre-assembled it all in our facility to look like this. I wonder, Michael, can we just spin this right around maybe, or is it sitting on? Well, there's cardboard on the top. Yeah. <coughs> 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 messed up on that one, eh? So this is the actual inverter part here. So this is what takes the DC energy from the array and the battery banks and, and changes it to uh, AC. And then here is just a uh, <coughs> distribution panel. So this is just for your, your DC, all your DC connections, your AC connections and to, to meet code for safety. And then these are the charge regulators. So these far, four charge regulators will, will monitor the uh, energy from the 48 modules that'll provide energy for the system. So this comes in a bazillion pieces. We put it together in our facility. We actually tested it. It's been started up already, programmed. Uh, we do go through a quality control test, make sure everything's working. And, and then when it comes to here, you know, two or three people can just lift it up on the wall and make your connections and everything's ready to go, right? So that's uh, how we handle that. And a whole bunch of battery cables to tie everything together. And so that's how that all goes together. And then once, we, once they do the grand opening, you can see it all working together and actually producing energy. So, so would the charge regulators be on the poles or? No, they'll be, these are them right here. They're so mounted. They'll be, they're mounted right on this unit right okay. here. Yeah. So you would have a separate breaker box. Uh, for the building? This, like for the, this doesn't also include the breaker box. Like yep, it's right in the center there. Yeah, there's a, it's more of a disconnect here. Yeah. So, if, uh, and you can technically wire in. Uh, you can connect your hot water tank. Or, yeah, you could, but it's usually, for code purposes and making sure it's set up to, uh, properly, it's good to take this to a traditional distribution panel in the building, right? For for your breakers and stuff like that, right? So you would want that. Yeah. One separate one. Yes, yeah, you would for for code, right? Like if you're if you're on the top of you know mountain in the middle of nowhere, you, you know you could install some breakers in here, it'd be safe, but you wouldn't have to worry about meeting code, right? So it'd be a little bit different. But if you're doing something uh, where you have to meet code, you'd have to have the proper distribution panel and stuff. So then you yeah. want to resell your. Well, as long as you're fully that, off. That's right, hey. Eh? And carry insurance, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, eh? So yeah, just as we went back to uh, making sure stuff is clean, because in the bottom of here, like if you, if you take uh, uh, this cover off, there's uh, both top and bottom, there's filters and stuff like that, right? So you want to make sure this stuff is in a relatively clean area, right? Not in a, in a dust barn, right? Where it's going to be, you know, totally dusty, right? And, and, uh, so just where is this? It'll be in, in this building here, but they'll get it, uh, you know, have, have the room set up and, uh, and stuff like that, right? So, but, uh, we can have a quick look right where the uh, solar ray is going to mount on the bank, and then that's about all that we can look at for a portion of the right, Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Make sure we get the right end this time, hey? I think that's it, yeah. I totally put it on back. and it'll be routed up to the building, but it's all gonna be right down here.
So how far apart will they be? They'll be, they're pretty much going to be within a couple inches. Like, uh, you know, we're keeping everything pretty tight so it looks good, right? So they won't be tracking it ever? No, that, yeah. they'll be, for the most part, they won't be totally uh, parallel with the bank, but they'll be close, right? So they won't have to be too steep. So. So they're not, they're not the adjustable? Well, the, 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 mount, the mounts are adjustable, like the mounts that come with them are adjustable. But, but not automatic. Right? No, not automatic. No, and for for their use from spring until fall for this building, they won't need to worry about the winter. So in the winter, you know they'll be they they'll be shut down, uh, so they can leave the system on just to keep stuff charged. And if they do go in and they need power, then it's ready. But they're not going to have to be running like the entire heating system and stuff like that through the winter, right? So, uh, but the option is there if they ever wanted to down the road, they could. The, the legs and the mouse are just telescoping, right? So they could. We could raise them up in the you winter, and then it, it's still going to maintain the building anyway, yeah. just because it uses just so much. Yeah, yeah. So these are going to be like four foot high or something like that, or? Yeah, well, they're going to be. What do we set on? Like coming out of the concrete, how high are they going to be roughly coming out of the concrete? Well, almost kind of what you see there, and then they got a post and beam situation, yeah. and then the legs are adjustable on both sets of panels, so. The center panel holds the top of the lower set and the bottom of the upper set. Yeah, so yeah, it'll just be, uh, I mean, if, if those were, full, if the legs are fully extended and it's at a 65 degrees, uh, the top of the panels would be about seven feet high or so right now.